Good morning. My name is Deborah Johnson. I'm the Denver Clerk and Recorder, and I'm so excited that everyone is here today. It's nice and sunny outside, a little brisk. I was talking with a woman from Minneapolis, and she says it's even warmer there than it is here. So anyway, welcome to Denver, and we are going to have a very lively discussion today, I hope, anyway. Um, so what's the topic for today? Rank choice voting. Today we have a panel that's going to share some information, perspectives, in terms of what is rank choice voting. Also, I want you guys to put your thinking cap on in terms of is this appropriate for Denver? Um, you know, for me, this is like a dream come true. Back when I was running in 2011, Rick and I, we had these conversations. He kept bringing this up to me, rank choice voting, rank choice voting. And I had no idea what he was talking about, but I just nodded my head and um, said, thank you, Rick. Um, but anyway, here we are today, you know, a few years later, six years later, and we're actually having those conversations as a real possibility for the city and county of Denver. And, you know, Denver is always looking for ways on how we can improve um, elections or make them or have a model that really fits the city and county of Denver. And that's really the question, is ranked choice voting something that's going to fit or really be an advantage to the constituents um, for the city and county of Denver? Um, one of the things that I just want to emphasize is um, Denver has always looked at elections in terms of, you know, let's really make sure that it's fair, that everyone has a chance. Also, we want to make sure it's accessible. Everyone also has a chance to um, vote in, in the most convenient way that we possibly can make it for them. And also, we want to make sure it's secure. I'm sure you all have heard some of the national news in reference to the security of elections. Um, I can honestly say that we try very hard here in Denver to make sure that our elections are secure. And then transparency. That is always, a, to me, a landmark in how elections should be run. It should be not something secretive. We should all understand what we do and how we do it. So today, I want to say thank you to our distinguished panels members here that um, are here today, and um, Amber is going to do the introductions of the panel members. And, but I also want to thank Fair Vote, um, one of our sponsors, also Dominion Voting, one of our sponsors, and um, uh, Design for C Civic, Des what are they called? Center for Civic Design. Um, I also want to thank them for their sponsorship on this great event. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amber McReynolds. She's the um, Director of Elections here at um, Denver. And one of the things I did just for, didn't forget, but I want to really say thanks to my staff for really putting this all together. I knew it wasn't easy, so thank you, election staff. Okay, well, welcome, uh, as Clerk Johnson's mentioned, to Denver. Um, we, today is really about the future for Denver and what the voting model looks like. Um, there's been talk amongst the city about doing some things to perhaps move the May municipal election to November, and therefore we have to sort of consider what that looks like from a voting method perspective. Um, so we really want to be thoughtful about that conversation. We want to make sure we have a lot of time to think through what the options are. Uh, and today we want to focus on the topic of ranked choice voting. Um, we have an uh, expert group of people here today to talk about that, uh, so we're thankful to start that discussion here in Denver and really start considering what this may look like for the citizens. Um, for today, a couple sort of logistical items. Um, please sign in. There's a sign-in sheet on every table. Um, we will be sharing the materials. Uh, we are, Channel 8 is here, then they're going to be producing a video with today's event. Uh, we're also going to be sharing the presentations and some of the other resources that are going to be presented today and that we have available with the group. So just make sure you sign in so that we can get that information out to you. Uh, we also are Facebook living the event. So you can see sort of the iPad here and Joe from our team is um, going to be doing that. So that is available. That will be saved on our Facebook page, which is, which is Denver Elections. Um, so if you are going to ask a question, just given that we uh, 
have the Facebook Live and also the Channel 8 production, make sure you come up to the mic that's sort of right here in the middle near the iPad. Um, we will get to a question and answer period, and I just want to make sure that we um, get your questions recorded appropriately, so make sure you come up to the mic. Um, as I mentioned, resources and the presentations will be posted after the meeting. Um, and then we also, we've created a hashtag that should be on your agenda. You can use that if you uh, do any social media around this event. Um, and then that can be searched later on. Um, a couple other things that we're doing today. Um, we do have a mock election set up. Um, so Jimmy from our team. Our senior voting system analyst has set up a mock election on the tablets in the back of the room. Um, and then we also have paper ballots that I don't think have been passed out yet, but we will get those out to the tables. And you can go ahead and, and test out and try out voting on them. Uh, this is the one time where you can vote twice. Um, so if you want to vote on the, on the tablet device, you can do that. And you can also vote on a paper ballot. And we'd encourage you to do both just so that you can see the, the differences with the ranked choice model. Mm. Um, the other piece that I just want to mention is happening in Denver with regards to ranked choice is next week. And the Center for Civic Design, which is one of our uh, sponsors of today's event, and they've prepared some of the materials that are on the tables and some of the posters that are over here, um, they will actually be in Denver next week for a few days testing out different uh, ballot types and different ways of voting rank choice amongst constituents. So they're going to be at the Denver Public Library and their goal is to um, try this method out with about a hundred voters and then they will be interviewing voters, asking them for feedback and they'll pr be producing um, a report that summarizes their activities. So that's really exciting news because we really um, we want to be thoughtful about the impact on voters and that will be an important project that, that will come after this event today. Um, so with that, I want to introduce Rob Ritchie, and he's the Executive Director of Fair Vote. Um, he will be, he'll be serving two roles today. He's going to be a presenter, and he's also going to be moderating the panel um, as we go through today. Um, so the format is going to be Rob is going to share some things about ranked choice voting, and then each panelist will um, speak for about 10 minutes. And then we will have a question and answer period. And if you do have a question, make sure you come up to the mic. Um, and then we'll uh, tally the ballots and we'll get all of that together. And at the end, we will be presenting what the results look like from the ballots that you'll actually vote today. Um, so that's sort of what we're going to do. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Rob, and he'll s kick us off with some of the presentations. All right. Well, thanks so much. Amber and Deborah, and uh, being in here is, is terrific for one reason. Uh, this, this is a sort of a center for innovation and practices that are, are, are taking us to better elections in lots of ways. And so Denver has, has rightly been winning awards for doing you know, creative and, and sort of innovative work, and Amber and Deborah have been at the center of that. So great to be part of this discussion. Um, so um, I'm uh, director of Fair Vote, and uh, we're really pleased to, to, to convene this conversation and, and work with folks to, uh, to, to, to look at how ranked choice voting might, might work for city elections. Um, it's the 25th year that I've been doing this, and I just wanted to say, just because it's on our minds, that um, I founded the organization with several people. One was John Anderson, who ran for president in 1980. Um, and uh, uh, you might remember, ran as an independent after first running in the Republican primaries. And uh, John was, has just been a terrific person to work with. He died on Sunday, so we're all a, a little sad about that. But his um, sort of commitment to these issues was, was, was terrific. And I think um, an ex his, his story is an example of how ranked choice voting can sort of address issues at a very high level. Like when we're voting for president and more than two people run, which of course often happens in primaries, but also in general elections, you know, we don't have a system that really deals with that very well. And there's these you know, controversies that happen. John ran as an independent. Uh, Ralph Nader ran as independent. Ross Perot ran as independent. Pat Buchanan, you know, there's, there's, there's different candidates. And, 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 and then they can change, change outcomes or change people's perception of, of fairness. And ranked choice voting has, has, has gotten attention for that reason. Um, it, uh, it also just gets a it gets a lot of attention for just solving problems, and that's what we'll, we'll sort of get into today about why cities and counties have, have been using it. Um, I would say from the years of work that I've done on this that we would be seeing 
a lot more uses of ranked choice voting if we'd had voting equipment that from the get-go was kind of ready to, in essentially a turnkey way to say, well, let, let's try ranked choice voting. It seems to address this issue that we're having in our state, in, in our city. Um, and if, if that had been a straightforward solution, I, I suspect we'd have uh, a lot more uses. And that's why it's so important that when you're voting on this Dominion equipment, it's an example of what we're starting to see, which is all the big companies are getting ready to offer that. They're in different stages of it, but say this Dominion system um, is slated to be used in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico in March, and it'll have like first use, and it'll be like this very straightforward implementation. And so then it's you know a debate about does this, does this speak to an issue and make, and make politics better? So we're sort of getting through that. So that'll be a fun part of today of just sort of seeing, seeing it work in practice. Um, it's used a lot, so, so we're talking about something that may be a new idea. Um, even those who know about the idea sometimes know it as different names, so uh, we haven't always been as a overall uh, uh, movement, I suppose, about sort of raising this. It's been instant runoff voting and preferential voting in Australia and the alternative vote in the UK, and, and uh, you know, there's sort of different names. But ranked choice voting really describes what you do as a voter. Um, and uh, that's, that's the, sort of the, the, the name that, that we're seeing out there. Um, just as an example of places that are used for elections, for government elections, every voter in these countries uses it for one of their elections. Australia, Ireland, Malta, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Scotland, some of these aren't countries, but big parts of them, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and then some big cities like uh, London. In, in the United States, if you have this handout, which is over there near the coffee and cookies, but also there's at least one on each table, sort of talks about some of the places that are using it um, and some of the different uses. So why don't I um, first show an example of how ranked choice voting was just recently used. Four cities used it last month. Uh, one connecting theme for those cities is each one of them experienced much higher surges in turnout than they expected, so they all had significant upticks in turnout. And I think if we could get to the slide that shows that the Minneapolis Star Tribune covered a news conference that took place two days after the ones in Minneapolis, and these were candidates, both winners and losing, in uh, talking about the experience of running with ranked choice voting. I think it just goes for a little over a minute and a half here. So this is the new mayor of Minneapolis, and we could just go from there. I think Minneapolis uh, did what we do best, which is democracy at its finest. I mean, we have an activist, engaged population that is fully capable of enacting the change that they all envision. And I think uh, this last Tuesday, we proved that in a big way with, what was it, 45%? Was that what it was? 45%. With ranked choice voting, I believe that the voters had the opportunity to really speak. A lot of people have said, oh, elections are so much easier when it's just between two people. I don't have to worry about thinking and all those type of things. Well, I think it's actually good when voters have to think. Ranked choice voting allowed those individuals to take a chance um, on a candidate like me, on other candidates of color, to say, listen, I will vote for this person because my values are aligned with what this person is saying and what they will do. But if they do not prevail in the race, then I can vote the next second, you know, the next best person in my mind. This fear, which I think is a genuine fear that marginalized communities will then, you know, split each other's vote because, uh, you know, if you have two f uh, black folks in a race or if you have two uh, folks of color in a race that they'll split the vote. Um, and we see that that's not, that doesn't need to play out in these races. Participation is the heart and soul of democracy. When it wanes, democracy wanes. When it's thriving and robust, Democracy is not even robust. When you're talking to someone, it allows you even to continue the conversation. Even if they don't give you the first choice, you get to hear from them what they really care and ask them their second choice. As a result of that, there's been a, such positive response in the fourth ward. Um, there is a big change that's going to be underway, but um, a lot of folks are excited because they invested either their first, second, or third choice in me, and that choice um, helped them be excited when, when we were able to win. So that was sort of an interesting mix of candidates, uh, some winners, some losers, but all sort of experiencing this election where they had more than two candidates running in, in each of the races that these folks ran in, and they had this different incentive to talk to more voters. So we'll hear more about that. We're, we're, we're gonna have, we have a great set of speakers here. I'll go through my PowerPoint, um, and um, so the way we're gonna do this is, is, is we'll each have a presentation. I'll ask a couple questions. Amber might have a couple questions of each speaker, and then we'll ultimately open the, the, the floor to everybody else. So um, 
here's uh, a start, and we'll go to the next slide. So, uh, oh, I can click, can I? I have power. Um, good, sorry. So uh, this is the, the ranked choice ballot over here. It's sort of an example of what one looks like when, when, when you're voting on paper. Um, and, and so you'll notice that you know, you'll have candidates and you don't just have a single mark to do by each candidate um, or a single bubble, but you have uh, a grid, a kind of an array. Uh, there's different designs, but this is one that we think works well. And so what you would do as a voter is um, say, Hmm, it's Michelle Kwan, Carl Lewis, and Serena Williams picking like great athletes. Well, who do I think is my first choice? And you would like fill in that first bubble, and then you fill in the second bubble for like, okay, I really like Carl Lewis as my second choice, and so on. And then that's what you do as a voter. And then it turns out the voters handle that exceptionally well. Um, and and, and uh, we've, we, we, we've seen that happen. It's, it's recommended in Robert's Rules of Order, where you see a lot of NGOs using it. Um, Robert's Rules actually recommends like if we as a group were choosing a leader, they would say vote and then vote again and vote again and sort of like gradually pick a winner and often they sort of coerce that by saying the person in last place would be out and then you vote again. If you don't have time to do that, you don't want to do that, this is what ranked choice voting essentially is simulating that. So they say hey, if you're voting by mail, if you don't have time to do repeated voting, do ranked choice voting. And so you see lot, you literally hundreds and hundreds of major um, associations use it. Um, and then it's used in those international uses. Oscars use it for best picture, which is of course fun. Um, and um, then we'll go into uh, the basics of what you do. So when there's two people running, right, and you vote for one, you've really given a lot of information that's sufficient, right? Because one is going to get more votes than the other, and they're, they're going to be more than half the vote. If they happen to tie, then you've got to you know, recount or something to do with it. But you know, generally, that's a straightforward thing. When you have three candidates run, you know, votes can be, can be spread. With a ranked choice system, you, you've ranked rather than just vote for one, and you add up first choices just as votes. Right? And if someone wins more than half the vote, half the first choices, you're done. You have a winner just like any election. But if you have a situation like this where there's no majority winner, so Denver has runoff elections, right? So, so what Denver does, you come back and vote. Here, A and B don't have, those, those voters don't have to come back and run again. Um, you do it, you know, instantly. So, so what you do in, in this situation, uh, C is the candidate in last place, has the fewest votes. So it doesn't make this instant runoff. And you do it one by one, rather than voting them a sort of all, you get rid of them all at once. Um, you, uh, so the, the, the C uh, candidate is out. Those voters have indicated who their second choice is. You look at those ballots. You add the second choices to whichever candidate is on the ballot. And, 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 and then that's the, sort of the next step. In this, in, in this example, A attracted enough of those second choices to go over 50% when it's going down to uh, two candidates and you have a clear winner. So at the end of the count, you know, no ballot counts for more than one candidate at a time. It's not a point system, right? It's like it's a, your vote's going all in for your first choice, but then if your first choice loses, then it goes all in for your second choice. And at the end, it's sort of A versus B, head to head, who beats the other one-on-one. One on one. Who's ranked ahead of the other on, on a majority of ballots? So we see this being considered for, for, for various reasons. The, the one that actually connects most of the cities that have adopted ranked choice voting is the conversation that is seemed right to have in Denver, which is do you want to fill an election, fill a, an office with two rounds of voting separated by several weeks or just do it in one election? Um, and, and so that is uh, a choice that several cities have, have, have made. We'll, we'll hear about some in the Bay Area, Minneapolis. There's different kinds of runoff elections. Like the old one in Minneapolis was they would vote in uh, before the, uh, the general election. They'd vote in September. And then if there were, um, uh, they would just winnow the field down to two. So you couldn't win in September. You just you know, winnow the field down to two and then have a, November election, so you often saw really low turnout in that election, because that's sort of this winnowing one, and then higher turnout when there's only two people. Or you sometimes see people more like the Denver situation, you can win in the first round, that's how San Francisco was, but if you don't, then you have a runoff. But in, but, but in those kinds of situations, an instant runoff gets it done in one. Uh, runoff elections are pretty common, actually, in the South, so we, we looked at the last 190 uh, regularly scheduled primary runoffs for U.S. Senate and U.S. House. There was one this year in that Alabama special election. They had a primary for the Republican contest runoff. But there's been 190 of those. 
Turnout declined in 183 of those 190 runoffs, and it declined by an average of 39%. Um, obviously, costs a chunk of money to, to, to run that second election. Uh, New York City has a citywide primary runoff. There's lots of conversation about instant runoff there. And uh, they, it cost them $20 million. I'm not actually sure what it costs here in Denver, but you know, there was a, you know, it'll cost you know, several million dollars. Usually, usually it's sort of like a, roughly a dollar per registered voter, up or down. Um, there also can be issues involving sort of tactical voting. You uh, see this when you have two different rounds of voting. Um, you, uh, you, you, you might uh, you know, feel your candidate's gonna get into the runoff and then you can kind of vote for someone who you think is a weaker, a weaker opponent in the first round. There's sort of different kind of gaming, like different people can, can, can vote. Like in Alabama, there's a lot of concern that the other party jumps in and, 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 and votes and it's, it's the other party's runoff to try to affect who uh, wins. And if you get it in uh, one round, it's, it, it's, it's much harder to do that. Um, you also have to raise money as a candidate, and you have to run longer, right? So just, just that, that sheer impact on candidates. Those are some of the things that, that draw attention to ranked choice voting over runoffs. Um, and then there's also, you could just not have runoffs and just have a, uh, whoever, top of the heap, the person who wins the most votes wins. Uh, that's actually pretty common for our primary elections for Congress and so on. That's what you do in Colorado. It's, you know, done, done in a lot of places. Uh, but... <laughs> We see this quite often. People can win with pretty low pluralities of the vote, 25%, 30%. You know, in the, uh, in the, the 2006 presidential race in the Republican field was very big. Um, there was not a single primary one with more than half the vote until late April. Um, you know, so most of the contest was effectively over before you saw your first, your first majority winner. Um, and uh, so an instant runoff, a ranked choice system would be a way to deal with that in one. Um, you also can have dynamics where it gets pretty divisive and because you're just, you know, you're, you as a candidate are either going to get the vote or not. Um, you might not even be really driving for 50%. You're, 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 you're just driving for the most. Um, and uh, I sort of have a quote here. They use this in, in various uh, parties sometimes use it for their nominations. Republicans have, have been using it in a number of such contests in Utah. They use it in Virginia in various ones. This is a quote from the Arlington uh, County um, party chair, the caucus's instant runoff system rewards candidates who not only supported their own backers, but are the second choice of those backing other candidates. And there was an interesting survey project done in 2013, 2014 in seven cities with ranked choice voting and 14 that don't have it as control cities and trying to look at, trying to tease out impact. And it found that there was a measurable difference of how voters perceive the campaigns as uh, more positive and more substantive and more engaging. Those were the sort of the three, the three things that we found interesting. Um, there are ways you can actually take ranked choice voting to another sort of level of conversation. Not this is really isn't a Denver conversation, but you know, uh, Colorado has primaries and then a general election for uh, the partisan offices. You know, theoretically, you wouldn't need to have a uh, primary. That's that's sort of another conversation, but say the, state, the uh, state of Louisiana doesn't have primaries. They just go to the November ballot with a runoff. And so we may see more uh, uses of it that way. One particular use that has always made sense to me, and it sort of seems popular where it's done, is that any place that has a runoff election, like Denver, um, you know, depending on state laws, that whether it permits it, um, could, could be uh, sending out a ranked choice ballot, an instant runoff ballot, to the overseas voters. Um, so we have five states actually do this for all their federal elections with runoffs right now. Um, and that's uh, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Um, and so actually a lot, you know, pretty good chunk of voters are, are, are using ranked choice voting in those races when they're overseas and they return a ranked choice ballot which can count in the runoff in, in uh, the event there's a runoff. And so they can have, they can then schedule the runoff much closer to the first round which sort of preserves uh, greater continuity for the in-person voters. Um, and uh, here's a quote from a South Carolina State Election Commission person who, who is a big fan of it. Um, so I'm going to skip past that one. There's sort of conversations about it for the general election, kind of the John Anderson one. So these are some of the, the issues, and we, we can get into this in the Q&A, but you know, I, I, I think the uh, ones you need to look at as a jurisdiction about ranked choice voting is, is are, is one ready to do it with, with the voting equipment and with other elements of election administration? Um, you know, costs, costs and timing. Um, and I think that that 
what we're starting to see, which is the, the companies beginning to, to put it into their systems, the regulators beginning to kind of put it in for what it means to have a certified system, and uh, you were, we're, on a, we're on a trajectory where I think within a certain number of years it'll basically be a, a, a built-in feature of, of almost everyone's system, at least any new one that they're getting. But you want to make sure that that's there or some way to get the count done. Um, and voter education, which, which you know, this is, this is a new system. We're all uh, supportive of, of voter education uh, whenever it can be done. Um, I think it's important to distinguish why to do voter education or, or sort of the things that are needed. Some jurisdictions have done very little, like Portland, Maine, um, uh, which is the biggest city in Maine, which, by the way, is set to use ranked choice voting for their statewide primaries in June. So that'll be a really interesting use because they have big open races for governor and there's like, you know, 10 Democrats and six Republicans and they'll be using ranked choice voting. But when they first put ranked choice voting in for mayor elections in Portland, the, the city didn't really, de decided not to really invest in voter education. There was some uh, outside work done, but they had a nice ballot design, clear instructions, 15 candidates, and you could actually rank up to 15. And that's sort of a decision to make about how many to permit to rank, but you know, we would recommend more rather than less, but you know, 15's a lot. Um, and uh, of the voters who came to the polls, and they had much higher turnout than they had expected to have, 99.8%, um, more than that, cast a, cast a valid ballot. So basically, you know, a really high rate of people cast an effective first choice. And more people chose to rank everyone than rank only one. So voters, when given this option, availed themselves of it, right? And so we're just sort of, in a sense, freeing the voters to do something that they often want to do. However, if it's a election result that is different, you know, like it's like, wow, someone didn't, was, wasn't ahead in the first round and then won, how did that system affect that? We find that the voter education you do before elections can really help people anticipate and get, and get ready for outcomes that might look different. And then when they happen, you can have that kind of reaction that uh, Minneapolis had. Minneapolis had multiple <clears throat> races with comeback wins and they weren't controversial because people are kind of at this point used to it. Um, there are legal issues that need to be looked at in every state um, and uh, you know, that's something that certainly Fair Vote um, and other people who like ranked choice voting are kind of ready to, ready to help people look at. But from, from everything that we know, say a city like Denver is, 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 is able to do it. There was a law passed in Colorado in 2008 to allow all, all general law cities to do it and it's used in a couple of the smaller communities in Colorado. Um, and then you want to look at uh, some of the questions people have about ranked choice voting, I'll, I'll, or, you know, concerns, or there, there's been one study that's often cited saying it might, it might depress voter turnout. Um, we, we don't think that study was, was as comprehensive as, as, as other studies that actually show that it has, at the very least, no negative impact. And what we're starting to see with more data points is, you know, maybe there actually will, will be an, a, a, an uptick in turnout, which sort of is from, comes from, I think, more candidates out there trying to engage with more voters. Um, and certainly we, as a measure of, of how voters engage with it, like uh, California cities all vote with ranked choice voting when they're voting on something bigger, like president or governor. And the number of people who skip that local race that now has ranked choice voting has declined. So more people choose to vote in the ranked choice elections than, than they used to with the old system, which I think is a kind of encouraging message that the at the very least, the ranked ballot isn't off-putting. Um, there are uh, you know, questions about different voting methods and different systems. Um, the reason why, why, why we are as, as settled as we are on, on, on ranked choice voting for, as an alternative for single winner is that it um, is, is very much proven in practice to not introduce what I would call sort of negative tactics or, 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 or sort of approaches where people are trying to game the system and some voters can get an edge over other voters. Right, where, where by knowing the system, you can like vote differently and sort of get an edge over other people. That just doesn't happen with ranked choice elections. And, and, and I think that's, that's a really key factor to look at when kind of comparing to, to other systems. Certainly voters are using it, and that's really important. So when you have these big elections for mayor, usually it's about 90% uh, of voters rank, rank a second choice. We'll get some data from Minneapolis. Um, and, uh, and if they can rank more than two, you know, maybe three out of four will uh, do that. They might not do that for a lower level race like city council, but they'll still, uh, more than half will um, usually rank, rank, rank candidates. Um, 
There's different groups out there, different resources. We're going to hear from some of them today, but RanktChoiceVoting.org is an important one, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. We're at FairVote.org. If you want to kind of play and like try out Ranked Choice Voting, RankIt.Vote is an app that you can create your own contest and share it with, share it with folks. So why don't I get into our, our really good group of, 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 of panelists here. Um, and so we, we're, we're starting with uh, Dave McDonald. Um, and Dave had really an interesting uh, place to be in uh, Alameda County, um, which is uh, East Bay of, of, of the, the San Francisco area, uh, with big cities, including Oakland. Uh, but three cities moved to ranked choice voting at the same time in 2010. And Dave was the registrar of voters after working for, for you know, 25 years at the, at, 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 at the county, often involved in sort of the technology and other parts of the the county election system, but then was in, in charge of elections with this really significant change going on in three cities at the same time. And uh, uh, just made, I think, sort of an, an admirable commitment to, to offering an opportunity for voters to learn about it. And I think can talk well about some of the voter education things there, but just on a personal level, made during the 2010 election season more than 300 presentations to different community groups about ranked choice voting. So, you know, hats off to, to him for his work on that. And then key uh, implementation decisions as was first used in 2010 and then used again in 2012 and it's been used uh, uh, every two years since, but, but was, the, uh, was the registrar of voters for those first two use, uses. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Okay. And here's your Can I, clicker. Yeah, let me stand up here. Maybe. Well, good morning. So as Rob said, I was the CIO for Alameda County for 27 years. The last six years of my career at the county, I was the Registrar of Voters. And kind of an interesting juxtaposition of, of jobs there. How do you go from technology to elections? Well, our Registrar quit three weeks before a pretty big election, and she didn't have an assistant. So I had worked with the Elections Department a little bit from the technology standpoint. So the Board of Supervisors asked me if I would go in and just run this one election. Just this one election, get us through it, and then we'll recruit and we'll hire somebody. So I did that, and the election ran pretty well. They interviewed, couldn't find anybody they liked. They asked me if I'd run just one more. So I ran one more, and of course, six years later, I was still running elections. They finally said, you know what, you're it just do both jobs. So I was a CIO and the Registrar of Voters, which really worked out pretty well because I had been trying to get the Elections Department to use technology more, but they were really resistant. So now was my time to put up or shut up. And so I think we really converted that department into being one of the best, uh, most advanced uh, uses of technology in elections. But at any rate, what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, Rob's already told you how RCV works. So I think you're all experts now, and you could probably run your own election. But I'm going to talk about the outreach and education that we did for voters. Um, and the question is, do you want to do uh, outreach and education? I'm a big proponent of yes, you need to do that. Uh, it is relatively simple from a voter standpoint, but you need to do your due diligence. You know, as an elections official, What's the one thing you want? You want every contest to be a landslide. You don't care who wins, you just want wide margins. And you, want, you don't want second guessing about why did you do this and why didn't you do that. So I just decided early on we were gonna do education and outreach. To put it in some perspective, Alameda County has around 850,000 registered voters. So that's, that's a lot of people to reach, but the, the, and 850 polling places, here you do all vote by mail, I understand. Is that right? Uh, what a dream come true for an elections official. Uh, we had 850 polling places, 4, 000, over 4,000 poll workers, three languages. Uh, now it's up to, I think, five languages. And over half of our voters vote by mail. So you're not done when the polls close on election night. We did ranked choice voting in Oakland, Berkeley, and San Leandro. Oakland has about uh, 220,000 registered voters, Berkeley 86,000, San Leandro 42,000. So uh, I don't know, whatever, 350,000, if, if my math is correct, of voters using ranked choice voting. So for our outreach, we did everything in three languages. Anything we did in English, we had to do in Spanish and Chinese. 
Uh, we put together a brochure and we mailed it to every single voter in those three cities in special mailings. Pretty expensive, so we know they got it. But you know how it is during election season. Your mailbox is full of stuff and it gets thrown away. So I'd like to think that everybody was fascinated by our brochure and they read it, but you know, I, I'm sure that didn't happen. Um, we, had, we had these brochures everywhere, libraries. Every time we went out, did a voter registration drive, we would pass these brochures out. Any community event, we'd have brochures available. So I like to think we, we got those brochures in the hands of everybody at some point. Um, some of the other things we did, uh, we put together a uh, PSA, public service announcement, that ran on some of the TV stations. Uh, we had pretty good uh, support and cooperation from the media. They ran a lot of articles about this, did a lot of interviews about ranked choice voting. So that, that got out pretty good. Um, you know when you go to the movies, anybody been in the movies recently? You see those commercials before the movie starts? Well, we had one of those. And uh, it ran maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds or something. In fact, I think we have that. Can we play that now? This will show you how, what I used to look like when I was in charge of elections. Hi, I'm Dave MacDonald, Alameda County Registrar Voters. This November, voters in Berkeley, Oakland, and San Leandro will use ranked choice voting for the first time. This means that for many local races, voters will be asked to rank candidates in order of preference, first, second, and third, on their specially designed ranked choice ballot. To learn more, go to our website, acgov.org forward slash ROV, or call us at 510 272 6973. Ranked choice voting. It's voting made easy. So that, that ran everywhere. At the movie theaters, you had to suffer through that before you could actually watch the movie. Uh, but you can see that's fairly simple. So we decided early on what we wanted to do was focus on marking the ballot. Because as a voter, that's what's most important. How do you rank your choices? Everything that happens after that, it's important to understand. Uh, but most people, quite frankly, just don't care. So we had a lot of information that described how that worked. I'm not going to go through all that today because you've, you've heard that already. I had an advisory committee uh, made up of uh, representatives from each of the three cities, also community folks. And we talked about what kind of outreach and education should we do? How much should we do? And it ranged from don't do any, it's so simple that nobody needs to hear a thing about it, to uh, you can't do enough. So we kind of landed in the middle there. And we had the mayors uh, and their representatives on that advisory committee. It, we had some interesting discussions, uh, as you can imagine. One of the things we did that I think was kind of interesting, we had a, a great partnership with our local transit agency, AC Transit. The general manager of that, the bus company, used to be my boss. She was on the Board of Supervisors. And so I talked to her, and she wonderfully, on her part, gave us a bus. And they put a, a wrapper on it. Have you seen those where they kind of like a big advertisement? The bus is one big advertisement. And so we, and they gave us a driver. So we went to, went to a lot of events. It got a lot of attention. And that's one of the things we use in our outreach effort. Uh, to, to register folks, but also to explain ranked choice voting. Um, now, Rob talked a little bit about uh, how many uh, ballots were valid. And so, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. After doing all this outreach, I wasn't sure what to expect, but we had over 99% of all ballots were valid. And now, let me explain what that means. A valid ballot is one where a vote was counted. So a, an example of a ballot that's not valid, so we had three choices. So an example of one that's not valid is where you vote for your first choice twice. So I vote for Sally number one and Joe number one. It's an overvote. So you have no way of counting that vote. That's a not valid ballot. If you just voted for your first choice, that's a valid ballot. If you ranked all three, that's valid. Okay, if you voted for the same person three times, first, second, and third, that's valid. Okay, so 99% of all of our ballots were valid. So did people really understand 
why they were doing that. Certainly a lot did, and certainly a lot didn't. But I think it, I think it worked well. In our, in our contest, we had some politicians running for office that would tell their constituents, vote for me all three times. Now, what's the strategy there? I really don't know. Uh, but, but that didn't help us much as we're trying to educate people on how to mark the ballot and the person they want to vote for is telling them the wrong information. Even though we had a very, very hotly contested mayor's race in Oakland, uh, really, really a lot of interest in that election. There were big candidate forums, they had debates, some, quite a few candidates in the race. I invited myself to each and every one of their debates and carved out just a few minutes before the debate started to go over ranked choice voting. And, you know, the, the guy who lost um, said he never understood the way it worked. He's a pretty smart guy. He used to be my boss, too. And uh, he, he understood it, but that was his, his excuse for not, not winning uh, the mayor's race. So, but I know that people understood how to mark the ballot. And that's, at least from our way of thinking, that was the most important thing to do. So, you know, really, how effective is outreach? I mean, that's something you have to decide um, how much time and effort you want to put into it. We put a lot. Um, instructions on the ballot are important. How many people read the instructions? Well, if you can see the way they mark the ballot, rank choice or not, um, you know the instructions aren't really, no matter how clear they are, uh, it doesn't quite quite cut it. I've got a whole, demonst a whole presentation I can do on voter mistakes, and I'm sure in Denver you guys have a lot of those as well. It's, it's shocking the kinds of mistakes that are made. One of the other things we did that I thought was effective since we do have polling places, uh, we had an extra poll worker at each polling place. Pretty big investment. Uh, we put a lot of extra training into that, that poll worker so they could explain when somebody walked into the polls, here's what ranked choice voting is all about, here's how you mark the ballot. If you have any questions, they could come over and, and help you. So that was, that was effective, I think. Uh, now here you won't, you don't really have that as an issue, I guess. So that's kind of what we did on outreach. We did a lot. I think it, I think it was effective. I think it's worthwhile doing. Uh, the more information you can get out, I think the better you are. So do we want to do questions now, or I'll be around later. I have other presentations, pictures, and all that sort of stuff. So what we'll do, Dave, if you could, is this mic? Yeah, this is working. So maybe I'll just ask you a couple. Amber might have a question or two, and then we'll go through, and then we'll be opening up uh, uh, it to everybody. So I guess one um, question that I have is um, you haven't been a registrar for a few years, but you've been sort of a resident, sort of seeing things. Um, there was a lot of voter education the first time, and then sort of less and less. Um, do you have a suggestion on kind of a best practice for that? That's one question. And then I guess if you uh, were to say important decisions, like, a, like say the timing of when to release results, sort of, sort of things that you think are kind of important lessons that you learned in the course of the process. Okay. Yeah, one of the nice things about being retired is I only do what I want to do. So, uh, you know, that I, I keep in contact with my the person that took my place, uh, mainly so he can just kind of cry on my shoulder and, and say, God, this is a hard job. Um, so, yeah, the outreach, at first, I thought it was very important because it is something new and different. So I think we probably did some overkill, uh, but I think that's worthwhile doing. I really do. The question is timing. How far in advance do you start talking about this? Well, how far in advance do you get mailings from people running for office? Kind of at the last minute, right? You get it all in your mailbox at the very last minute uh, because people don't think about elections six months in advance. So we did, we did a lot early on, but then we tried to ramp it up as we got closer to the election so it was a little fresher in people's minds. And that was mainly the mailings that we did. We, we mailed, had a separate mailing with just the RCV brochure. So some of it has to be kind of just in time. I think there was a question over here. And, and, and we'll take this one question, then we won't take questions until later for everyone, because just to kind of flow through. Okay. I was talking to one of our state representatives who's uh, trying to push alternative voting, and he said the greatest resistance that he'd run into were from the county clerks because of the cost and time and expense of trying to implement any kind of alternative voting. Can you 
talk about what the costs were and how you overcame that obstacle? Yeah, well, it's kind of kind of interesting. It's uh, I'm not a county was not a county clerk. I was a registrar of voters and, and the CIO, so I didn't have I'm not I was not elected. I was appointed by the board, um, and I always said and and we my role was to run elections on behalf of the cities, so it was really up to them to pay the expense. And so I always said, you know, whatever you want to do, we'll do it. All I need is money to, to run the election. And so the idea with ranked choice voting is it should save money because you eliminate the need for that extra runoff election. Um, and, and it does, if you don't have an election during that period of time. What we found with, uh, especially with Oakland, a very political city, uh, they always had something they wanted to do during that time when they shouldn't have had an election. So they had that expense anyway. But running a uh, ranked choice voting election is not that complicated. It's, so I don't think there should be much resistance from elections officials uh, to run it. Great, well, we'll we're, we're not gonna do more questions, sorry. So we're gonna get through the panel and then we'll open up to questions. So um, why don't we, uh, thank you, Dave. And so um, why don't we uh, move on to, to uh, Gerard Gleason um, is uh, here with us from San Francisco. And uh, Gerard um, uh, uh, can tell stories about the city that's had the most ranked choice voting elections o over the last 15 years. In fact, they had a uh, ranked choice voting election every November from 2004 until this November, which was the first one where they hadn't had one. Um, and uh, so we've had a sort of a whole like uh, new generations of politicians who have only known ranked choice voting elections. And Gerard was part of this transition, uh, working at the Department of Elections as a uh, staff person, actually coming dealing with the issues of, of ballot design, and then was on the San Francisco Election Commission for a decade, including as president of the San Francisco Election Commission, um, and then has just been a, a observer of San Francisco politics. So he can talk some about that. Turn over to Gerard. I used to design ballots. I hope I designed a PowerPoint that works here. Um, San Francisco, uh, or the voters voted in uh, ranked choice voting in uh, 2002. And actually, you'll see this is the actual question that was to the voters here. And at the time, it was instant runoff voting. And the, because of the word instant, it was, uh, I, th I believe it was San Francisco. I'm going to have to keep looking at Rob to see, verify this. It was sort of the catalyst for changing it to ranked choice, this right. terminology. Yeah. Um, and I believe we were also the first city after Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 1940s. That uh, or the next, yeah. Yeah, right. so there had been, there had been uh, quite some time uh, that uh, no jurisdiction had implemented ranked choice voting. So it's, I think Cambridge was in the, uh, Massachusetts in the 1940s. So uh, anyway, this was voted in by the voters. I was working at the Department of Elections, handling ballot design and publications. And uh, this was voted in and uh, I promptly quit. <laughs> uh, just, it didn't really have to do with this, but I just wanted to move on. Um, so it, it, it kind of evolved that nothing really happened. It was just one of those stalemates that I hear about around the country where people want to implement the ranked choice voting and then there's problems with the machines and blah, 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 blah. And one of the things they didn't have was a ballot. So I had contacted Fair Vote and talked to other people in San Francisco who were interested in this because it kind of did intrigue me at that point now that I didn't work at the Department of Elections. So if I've got my PowerPoint. So I designed a ballot. And this is the first ranked choice ballot. It's not a great design. Uh, and actually, I think Fair Vote had a graphic artist kind of fine tune it. But uh, and this I actually found on, on Fair Vote's uh, website. I didn't keep a copy of it myself 15 years ago. Uh, but there are samples on Fair Vote's website of various ballot, ballots from jurisdictions. I think San Francisco, there's like six iterations that it, that it went through. Uh, but this was what we did in 2004. The next thing would, to do was, well, once I designed the ballot, uh, somehow I found myself appointed to the San Francisco Elections Commission and San Francisco is the only county in California where they took the oversight of and uh, selection of the registrar voters away from the elected officials and it's a citizens committee. So they put me on to the uh, San Francisco Elections Commission at the point where we were going through the whole issue of getting a voting machine, get it certified and 
so we did our first election with ranked choice voting in November of 2004. I have to say, uh, their vendor at the time, uh, ES&S, put together a machine. It worked. I characterize it as the iPhone 1. Uh, but you know what? The iPhone 1, you can make a phone call. did what it needed to do. So anyway, uh, there was, uh, it, Dave brought up a lot of things about outreach. I won't go into it, but this is a sample of something that San Francisco did. And I, I, I just love this because the story was they couldn't afford a graphic artist, but somebody could draw a smiley face. So they did smiley face, frown face. You know, if you'd selected all three, it was a frown face. But anyway, this is a, a sample of postcard they sent out to people. And again, the major education piece was how do you mark the ballot? The other part I want to mention is that there's, when they tabulate the votes and they run the algorithm, people do need to know that. And there are, uh, on San Francisco's website, I'm sure the other counties, I know Minneapolis, I believe, did a, an excellent video showing uh, with colored post-it notes. Is that, that's Minneapolis? Yeah, if you see this online, San Francisco, I think, borrowed it. <laughs> it's on the San Francisco Department of Elections website, but I think if you want to see the original, you go to Minneapolis and look at theirs. Uh, but it'll show how the tabulation works. And that's a real important thing that you disclose. People don't really need to know that as much as they know how to mark the ballot, but you need to disclose that issue. Um, and this is one of the things on the Department of Elections where they show, this is in uh, November 2010. This is, this is a reporting of the round by round uh, and elimination here. This, this was a District 2 Board of Supervisors. It only went to two rounds. You see where the, they transfer here. You can see these on the San Francisco Department of Election. I'm sure the other counties have these, but there's all kinds of, of data and things that are disclosed you know, how, how the rankings were, were just, uh, chosen and transferred votes and things of that nature. Uh, but the reason I really wanted to show this is really important is down here, this is the, the raw data images. And if you collect all your ballots and votes on election night and then take them in the back room there. I think I was in this room three years ago. You got machines named after sports teams or something. If you come out three days later, which is what San Francisco did, the election was on Tuesday, they decided to post the first choice votes and waited till Friday, the first election we did, to run the algorithm. Okay, so three days later they come out with ta-da, and you know, people have rightly have questions. Hey, where did that come from? So, San Francisco, we went through a big, uh, quite a few arguments about how to win and how to do this. And I think uh, Alameda County uh, worked in conjunction when they, when they did it too, of making the raw data available immediately to disclose what the rankings were on the individual ballots. And the other thing, they started to move up. They did it on Friday, then they moved it to the Thursday. And now San Francisco runs the algorithm at, right after eight o'clock when they get the first returns. They run the algorithm that'll show all the rankings on the votes. It's gonna continually change until 100% of the ballots are counted. Because naturally in, in a rank choice voting, you really, you're only gonna run the final algorithm when you have all of the ballots in, in hand. And we, in San Francisco, we have a lot of provisional ballots, a lot of uh, vote by mail that come in late. Uh, so I wanted to show you this is what the raw data is. And this looks like a nightmare from hell, right? Uh, 2001. Uh, and there's a key on how to read this, okay? Uh, no, uh, and we're, on, we're, we're, we're being filmed here, but I'm gonna show this anyway. <laughs> I used, when I was doing ballot design and publications, one of the things we had to do was maps. And I learned from a cartographer this term called the bunny, where you put in a, a fake street or alley so you know it's your map. And so I, in 2010, in District 2 where I live in San Francisco, I decided I was gonna put a bunny in and see if I could find my vote, okay? Now, when you do rank choice voting, it's like ice cream, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, you make your pick. Well, I picked strawberry, peanut butter mayonnaise, and vanilla. And I figured nobody was going to pick something in that. 
and it was a sincere vote because I, and on this one, I was only going to vote two rankings. So anyway, when this raw data comes out for this district, this is 90,000 90, lines. And I actually found this analog, and I, I, I can go through and explain it to you. I have it on paper if you're interested in seeing how I know that this is my ballot. But I just wanted to see if it's true that you could actually go through here and find data and that it's valid. So anyway, I, I, I found that interesting when I did it, and I just wanted to share it with people. Um, the other thing uh, I wanted to touch on was, as, as Rob mentioned, just an observer of politics and, and how something like ranked choice voting affects campaigns and the nature of politics. Uh, in San Francisco, I, I can say that when, when ranked choice voting was implemented, has it changed things? The answer is yes and not yet. And in San Francisco, we have citywide races that we use this for, mayor, public defender, district attorney. And most, the thing is, when you, when you, change, a, when you change the rules of the game, you change the system, you haven't really changed the players. And we're still having situations where we have the impact of money in politics. So people don't run against incumbents. And so we haven't really had the dynamic races like David mentioned over in Oakland, where they actually did have a dynamic race. And some thought of ranked choice voting could be utilized like, you know, to get biblical, David and Goliath. Somebody could be real smart and go get some stones and a sling and take down a Goliath. And that, I think that's possible. I, th I think it's the case in Oakland, there was a Goliath who was laying on the ground with a lump on his head wondering what happened. Uh, but where we do see it in San Francisco is uh, they had, in 2000, changed the County Board of Supervisors, which is like the city council, because the city and county, from uh, 11 seats, it's now it's, it's by district instead of at-large. And when you go from an, an at-large system to a district, the idea is you get the neighborhood activists, you get a little more grounded, the local people know who folks are. But when you take the, the at-large and go to districts, well, we had cases where, you know, the incumbents moved into a district later, and we had one guy in San Francisco who moved into a motel. Uh, and it took a while for that to churn out. That was in 2000. Now we are actually getting the local activists or the people you see at the farmer's market on Sunday. So it kind of, it takes a while and it percolates up. Where we're seeing change with ranked choice voting and the way people are handling campaigns and sort of dispensing sort of with the nastiness and, 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 and the issues of the underdog could actually prevail uh, is in when, where we have these uh, district smaller areas, the, the, the uh, county board of supervisors. We're seeing races where people in the first round they're getting, you know, the top two candidates will get 34 and 39 percent. And every one of our districts in San Francisco where it hasn't been an incumbent running has actually been a dynamic race where the, where the candidate who won actually needed those second choice votes. So I, I see that, 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 that change coming up. The other thing I see is that some of these candidates now, since they're out there and uh, uh, sort of knowing that they need these second choice votes, they're getting along better with other candidates. And we find that some candidates who have lost are being appointed to commissions and boards because people see that, you know, this person lost, but they actually had a great idea about transportation or policing or something of that nature. So I think it's, I think it's going to percolate up in San Francisco and change, and change the dynamic, which is one of the things that Fairvote talks about. So just as a, as a political observer of the local politics in San Francisco, I think, I think it's, it's going to happen. It hasn't happened on a citywide level yet, but it, it is happening and sort of the, the minor leagues uh, of the uh, elected establishment. Anyway. Thank you, Gerard, that's, that's right. super helpful. I'm gonna keep it, keep it flowing just so we can get to the, the more open question time. Um, I'll say one of, just a couple of stats that sort of always jump out to me about the Bay Area. One is when um, Oakland changed, they used to have you could win in June and then you had a contingent November runoff. The uh, 18 offices in Oakland elected by RCV 
the first 18 RCB winners of those offices won more votes than their predecessor in 16 of them. So that sense of just people winning with more. Um, and um, in, there's 53 offices in the Bay Area that are elected by ranked choice voting. And in a sort of a sharp uptick, 60% are held by women and about 60% are held by people of color. And both of those are significantly higher. And I think part of that is that bigger electorate, November elected, kind of in running inclusive campaigns. Um, and we've seen that kind of impact in Minneapolis, and I, we're uh, really fortunate to have Elizabeth Glidden here, who has served 12 years on the city council, having won first in uh, a non-RCV system with, uh, with that kind of early winnowing primary and then uh, November election, and then has seen RCV used uh, in three subsequent elections that uh, the city, after passing it, 2009, 2013, and 2017, and has been a close observer of the process and can tell us her stories. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rob. And I need some help getting up a presentation here. Uh, while you're doing that, let me just uh, say again, I've, uh, I'm kind of rounding out my time on the Minneapolis City Council. I chose uh, not to run again, which opened up uh, my seat for some uh, other candidates, and that's another story in and of itself. But uh, I was first elected in November of 2005, and just to kind of reiterate what was the Minneapolis system before we adopted ranked choice voting, uh, all cities in uh, the state of Minnesota, unless they have a different system that they have chosen, and that's usually because they're a charter city, uh, have what we call a nonpartisan primary. So the top two candidates um, of any party, and usually uh, it is more common in cities across Minnesota that people don't announce, other than in Minneapolis and some bigger cities, what their party might be. Uh, and they run in the nonpartisan primary, and then the uh, top two vote getters go to November. So it's a September primary and November election. And uh, in the city of Minneapolis, we um, have uh, all of our seats are up in one election. So we have a mayor, we have 13 council members, we also have an elected park board and some other miscellaneous positions. All those are up at one time. So that's why we've only had three elections since we adopted ranked choice voting. Um, let me just say a couple things about why I think in Minneapolis uh, we adopted ranked choice voting. What were some of those uh, themes that arose and uh, then our process for that. So um, in Minneapolis, um, a, a primary is, is a pretty low turnout event. So if you have 15% participating in a primary, you have a pretty good primary actually. So um, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with that. Also you have a certain demographic. The demographic in Minnesota is even whiter and older than your traditional demographic, which is Minneapolis is a fairly uh, white state. So um, that was a concerning thing. Second thing I'll say is in Minnesota, also in Minneapolis, we have a lot of tradition of supporting third party candidates. Um, and there is a perception that if you're a third party candidate, you never can be viable because you're always seen as a spoiler in the race. And so this actually was a theme that was very uh, popular to talk about in Minneapolis. We don't have a lot of Republican candidates in Minneapolis, but we have had Independence Party candidates, Green Party candidates, and uh, recently Socialist uh, Party candidates, as well as what we call our Democratic Party, which is uh, DFL, Democrats, uh, Farmers, Laborers. Um, in the state as a whole, both we had kind of this third party uh, uh, issue, but also there was the picture of what would happen when you have what is this kind of plurality winner. And so this was happening over and over again in our state elections, where also we have a strong third party um, tradition. Um, and so you would have uh, winners uh, who would have in the 30s, you know, for the governor's race. And so that feels really disappointing that you have a governor who's there for everybody. Um, and this was a theme that was reflected in Minneapolis. We had a rigorous um, petition drive in 2006. Um, and this was a drive to put this question on the ballot for the voters in Minneapolis, whether to use ranked choice voting. And uh, I was a participant in that election. I was a big advocate for ranked choice voting. And 
and um, we won that ballot measure with two thirds of the vote. And I will say, even though we kind of have gone through some growth around using ranked choice voting in the city of Minneapolis, we really have seen just, I think, increasing support for this system as opposed to more divided opinion about did we do the right thing. So that has been the tone and the tenor in the city of Minneapolis. Um, am I up there? Oh yeah, here I am, sorry about that. Here's a couple of key findings to share from 2017. Again, this is our third time that we've used ranked choice voting. Um, and this was one thing that was just super, we, we had this big surge. And so you saw the mayor-elect in the video at the beginning, he talked about having 45%. Let's see, where do I get this? Oops. So this is uh, just a little graph that shows um, how much uh, we increased. Uh, normally you would see in a general election more like in the 30s, low 30s as a turnout in a general just municipal election. I don't know what in Denver sort of your general turnouts are in your more general uh, election. Um, and then you can see the line down there about uh, the primary. So A, we had tremendously increased participation in this election, but also regardless of even with the lower participation, it was much different who you were playing to as a candidate uh, if you did not have a primary. All right, that was just, I'll just go through that. Okay, so this is the next thing that happened in Minneapolis in our 2017 election. And I'll, we have an example from the mayor's race and we have an example from a candidate's race that I wanna share. But um, we just had tremendous participation in people ranking their ballots. So they didn't just show up and rank their favorite candidate. They ranked at least two and many ranked uh, three candidates. And so here, if you're able to, I think this is kind of small, but I will read out in the mayor's race, 87% um, of voters ranked at least two candidates. 73% of voters ranked at least three candidates. Um, and I will say, um, and again, when we look at the mayor's uh, example, you'll see this a little bit more. We had an interesting field in city elections in Minneapolis in 2017, um, where we probably had, I, I consider, five of those candidates for mayor to have visible and viable campaigns. And when we look at this election, I'll kind of tell you who raised the most money and who didn't, and you'll see it's kind of surprising, actually, when you look at who won. Um, we had a valid ballot rate of um, almost 100%, and again, that was explained. This means that people filled out their ballot uh, correctly, and also we have a system in Minneapolis where you can feed your ballot into um, the machine, and it will kind of spit it out if you haven't filled it out correctly. So we have a mechanism to automatically assist with that. Where am I going here? Whoops. Um, we had uh, just a tremendously diverse slate of candidates. Again, I think this goes to this issue of who, who, is, who is electing these candidates? So now you are, as a candidate, um, you have one election. It's more about turnout. It is about reaching as many voters as possible. It's about talking to everyone that you can, uh, even those who have said, someone else is my first choice. And we heard candidates say that they felt more comfortable coming into the race um, even if they weren't sure how viable they were in the beginning. So we um, ended up uh, with, again, just a very diverse slate of candidates. Um, these are people who were elected. The first two transgender council members were elected, uh, and the first Somali American and Latina council members were reelected in this election. Um, and for Minneapolis, this is a big change. And again, this is not fully reflecting 
the whole slate of candidates who are running. All right. Let's see. I'm going to skip that. Okay, so I wanted to get to this example <coughs> from the mayor's race. Um, <coughs> So here we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so we have essentially what I talked about were these top five mayoral candidates, and then this was other. Um, so again, this was kind of an interesting race. We have an incumbent who was running for re-election, and she did not win her race. Um, Two year, uh, four years ago when we had a mayoral election, we had what I think is, is, had been more traditional than what I had seen, which is that you had like a couple of candidates just sort of rise above the pack and uh, kind of hold on to that. So it felt, even though like there were more candidates, it felt like there were two main candidates. That was not the feel in Minneapolis this year. Um, you saw, um, uh, I'm gonna go through here. Um, so here, um, they first uh, eliminated the other candidates. And we knew the, who won the mayor's race. Uh, we had an inclination of who might win the day of the election. And we had final confirmed results for the mayor's race um, by uh, the early afternoon of the next day. So those ballots moved to voters' second choices. <clears throat> um, round two. Round three, Nakima Levy-Pounds is eliminated. She was the African-American woman who was featured in the um, early video. She was a candidate, I'll just say, in uh, the last uh, elections report that I saw, she raised only $40,000. So I just want to say, this is like an election where someone like that, who I will say was someone who had a lot of popular following, um, was able to come out um, in the top five candidates in a competitive uh, race. And I'll just, a child, right? And she had a baby uh, on the campaign trail. Um, yes. Um, Tom Hoke is eliminated. I'll just want to mention him because he was the candidate who raised the most money. Um, he spent a lot of his own personal fortune. Um, he raised about $750,000 that he spent on the race. Um, so he was gone next. I'll just flip through this because um, I will say on our elections website, which you can see at vote.minneapolismn.gov, they have a very interesting graphic that shows how people's votes uh, went once they were eliminated. And so you might just want to take a look at that. Betsy Hodges is eliminated. She was the incumbent mayor. Her, um, and then we had, whoops, then we had a, a winner with 57% of, of, uh, of counted ballots or continuing ballots. All right, this is one other race just to kind of take a look at because there's this kind of shorter story to tell here. Um, this was a race between um, a 20 year incumbent and uh, she had two challengers. Um, this was a race, we, we do do endorsing of candidates in Minneapolis. Nobody was endorsed in this race by the party. Um, although the challenger, Philippe Cunningham, was the closest. Um, and um, what ended up happening here was, uh, so there's round one. Um, there were two challengers, Stephanie Gasca, and Philippe Cunningham. And in round two, Gasca and then uh, another candidate, Hansen, were eliminated. Um, there, um, Gasca and Cunningham clearly were aligned candidates. Um, they, uh, and they ended up promoting a message towards the end of the campaign where they encouraged uh, the other person's supporters to please rank them as their second choice. So there was an alignment that, that happened there. And in the end, even though Barb Johnson was first in the early round, um, 
Philip Cunningham received the lion's share of these other votes. This was a big story. He was, um, uh, he was a surprise candidate to win that race. And this is just another graphic of that. But she, <clears throat> she was not successful, the incumbent, in attracting enough second choice votes to put her over the edge. And this is uh, the winner, um, Philippe Cunningham. Um, I think I've taken up quite a bit of time here, but I will just say um, that I'm, I feel sad that we weren't able to have our elections, uh, our city clerk here, Casey Carl, um, he had to deal with a recount in one of our races and he's preparing for you know, a, a new mayor and a bunch of new council members. Um, but uh, people should feel free to reach out um, to Casey Carl in the city of Minneapolis. Um, he has been <clears throat> a great advocate of how to institute this elections method uh, well with integrity. Our elections team has won some national awards. And also just to this point of engagement with voters, um, I feel like our, our whole elections team has continued just to be creative in how to engage with voters. It's like the work around ranked choice voting has ushered in a whole new um, kind of way to do the work of the elections department, where they now perceive that part of their work is about continuously educating and engaging with voters, making sure they have good information about how to fill out their ballots and all this kind of thing. So um, it has ushered in um, also a lot of policy changes at the city of Minneapolis on how to make things work the best way that they can for voters. So thanks for letting me share our story. Thank you, Elizabeth. One more speaker, um, and uh, thanks, thanks for uh, sticking with us, and um, a terrific set of information being presented, I hope. I'll um, say the one part of the Minneapolis story that sort of jumps out to me from like looking at that mayoral result is that if it had been the old system in Minneapolis and those first choices had translated into votes, which you don't know for sure would have happened, but it would have been the two biggest spenders, two white men would have advanced and been the only general election candidate when turnout was much higher, but they had this sort of richer debate with, with, with more people, which is analogous to what Denver, where you don't have the sort of win-a-win election, you have everyone run in the first round um, and someone can win in the first round, but some of the systems out there wouldn't allow that. Um, and uh, St. Paul also used ranked choice voting and uh, they, uh, sort of interesting example of, it was a big open seat race for mayor. People thought it would have multiple rounds um, 10 candidates running, and a candidate ultimately won 51% of first choices, so sort of, uh, sort of pushed forward and will be the first African-American mayor of St. Paul. But part of the coverage of it that I really appreciated just following was that people you know, felt that all these candidates contributed to the dialogue about the city. So even if it sort of looked like a first round result where just it was normal, you had sort of people be, 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 be part, of the, part of the dialogue and, and, and part of what he, as a successful candidate, had to learn how to be people's second choices of. So our last speaker is going to be Connie Schmidt. And um, one of the, the, the great uh, uh, advances for us at Fair Vote is the, the rise of the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, which is uh, run by uh, former election officials, all with some direct experience with Ranked Choice Voting, but who can really get into how to make this work and how it's working and be a resource to communities and states as, as they look at ranked choice voting. And, and Connie is, is an example of what a great asset they have. She was election commissioner for Johnson County, Kansas for nine years, uh, city clerk for Merriam, Kansas for 20 years, has been doing a lot of consulting, uh, has done some work with the uh, Election Assistance Commission and uh, directs uh, consulting to Casey Carl and some work in uh, Minneapolis. So Connie. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Amber, and your group for hosting this event. It's a very nice turnout, and we're very happy to be here. Um, as Rob said, my background is totally in um, local government and service to the public, and um, the last nine years were spent um, with the best job on earth, which was managing elections in the large county in Kansas, in the Kansas City metro area. Since then, it's been a lot of my privilege to work around the country um, with a lot of um, 
initiatives in various states and jurisdictions um, in 2011, 2013, 2017 in Minneapolis, where I learned for the first time about ranked choice voting. The last couple of years, it's been another privilege for me to be associated with a team of people that developed the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. And I'm really excited about it because it is basically um, a place where any election administrator, voter, um, public official, any one candidate, if you have any questions about ranked choice voting, you can go to this website, rankedchoicevoting.org, and you will find all of the information that we have been able to find anywhere across the country. And so the group that I'm working with, as Rob said, are retired uh, and former election administrators. Um, we're very big believers in elections and sharing best practices so that no one has to reinvent the wheel. And so um, we're very proud of everything that we have there. It's from all the jurisdictions across the country who have um, implemented ranked choice voting from legislation um, to any other kind of ideas that are there. Um, Part of the things that it includes is a compilation of really what is ranked choice voting. And so you can click on various tabs on the website if you're a voter or you're a candidate or you're an election administrator and go to various places of information that would help you understand what it is. Um, for example, there's information on how to mark your ballot. And so you, if you were a voter or if you were running for office, there's information there. Um, from other places across the country, including samples. Um, we have information on single winner ranked choice voter and multi winner ranked choice voting races. Um, the election toolkit is probably one of my favorite places. Um, we have started this year um, a webinar series that we've been doing online, and I'll talk a little about that in a moment. Um, we have a lot of reports and presentations that we have done across the country and various reports that I'll um, talk about. We've been working with the Center for Civic Design on usability toolkits and education toolkits. Um, so the first thing, um, the webinar series. And those webinars are posted on that website, so if you're interested in any one of them or all of them, you can go on your own and view those. Um, the first one we did was to introduce everybody to really what the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is and how we can help you. And I need to add that our services are provided free of charge to any jurisdiction, um, including travel. So we are here um, as a resource and to help in any way we can. Uh, one webinar was basically the ABCs of Ranked Choice Voting, and that was kind of a... Um, an introduction to what is ranked choice voting and what does it mean, where is it being used. And then we've done one on the history, going back to the beginning of when ranked choice voting was first started in the United States. And then the usability studies on how to design a ballot, um, voting systems capabilities, including statewide, how do you do this um, for a whole state, and designing the most important, which is voter education and how to present election results uh, to the voters. Uh, we're going to be doing more webinars um, in 2018, and again, those are all going to be posted on our website as we go along. Um, the toolkit um, has a variety of reports and presentations that our team has put together. Um, the first one we did, we called it the Ranked Choice Voting Compilation. And you can print it out there. It has active hyperlinks throughout the document that will take you to other best practices across the country. But it's basically just that. It's where has this been done before? How can I see what was done before? How can I get an example of how someone else that managed elections did this? And so that's where we'll find that. The other uh, report that I think is really good is implementation um, of ranked choice voting with multiple voting systems. You're fortunate in Colorado you have all one voting system statewide. Not every state has that convenience. There are many states that have um, various voting vendors throughout the jurisdictions. And the model RCV implementation plan is one that we've just finished in September. 
and it basically takes, it's a roadmap that we put together for any jurisdiction that was thinking about going to ranked choice voting as a model for uh, managing elections. From how do you pass legislation, what are some examples of model legislation that you can take a look at and print off, um, to how do you do voter education, all the way through how do you build the ballot and how do you actually provide election results on election night. So there's a lot of really good information in um, these reports and presentations. Um, the one thing I wanted to um, talk about uh, very briefly is the Center for Civic Design. Um, we have several reports on the website that they have done. They've been a wonderful partner to Fair Vote and the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. I think you have some handouts on your table. On the website, we have the Principles and Guidelines report that was done by uh, their team, the ballot design testing documents, and I understand they're gonna be here in Denver um, later this month to do some more for you all voter education testing documents, and they did go to Minneapolis and they have tested a lot of this information there. And how do you present election results on election night um, to your voters and to the candidates? So some of the highlights um, for their design report, and I have to say many of these when I was reading the, through these preparing this PowerPoint, pertain to elections in general, and I think one of my colleagues earlier said the same thing. It's really not any different than just managing a normal election. Uh, so many of the guidelines you're gonna see for the Center for Civic Design pertain to any election that you're doing. Give voters the information they need to prepare to vote. The only thing is when you're going to rank choice voting from a normal, regular election where they just vote for one person, you have to explain the benefits and the basics of what is rank choice voting. Be prepared to answer their questions and be able to show voters how their ballot is actually going to be used in counting and tallying election results. Um, and so one way to do that is this is a sample. They may be on your tables. I think I might have seen this one um, that the Center for Civic Design put together. So basically, in very simple language, what is ranked choice voting? Why are we using it? with as few words as possible. And you notice their icons and their words at the bottom for why it's being used. Save money, stronger voices, broader participation. And so those simple words can, can help a voter and the general public understand more about how to, how to use it. So that's an example that they put together. Um, another uh, guideline that they presented was all of the information should be in clear and simple language. Any of us that have been in elections for any period of time have this kind of pounded into us. Clear and simple language is very important. Keep the information short and to the point and use everyday words so that anyone will be able to understand it. In elections, we kind of call it uh, kindergarten words, you know, make it simple for everyone. Use illustrations anytime you can, and use icons very sparingly to draw attention to different types of information. And I have added the Minneapolis Voter Guide from 2017, and uh, they're really proud of it. They've done a great job in Minneapolis through the years improving each year on the process, their mission um, that we kind of started in 2013 was to be the gold standard for ranked choice voting, and I'm so proud to say that they really are. Um, so this voter guide that they did in 2017 utilized the information from the Center for Civic Design on how to do this best. Um, some other information that was presented um, is the how to do election results on election night. And as Councilwoman Glidden uh, pointed out, the Minneapolis folks really set a high standard in the 2017 election. If you can go to their website and click on the mayor's race, you can see this really marvelous visual of how each 
round of, of tabulation moved various results from one candidate to the other candidates. Um, so they did a very, very good job on that. But use a combination of text and graphics to tell your story. Use color and shading icons to draw attention to um, the various pieces. It's important to include the details of where their voters expect them and use labels to remind the voters of their most important information. And probably the most important thing is to use plain language if you're explaining uh, local or state laws and terms and, and just very few words to help people understand. Um, an example is this visual, I think it's on your table, that the Center for Civic Design um, created um, for us in partnership. And it does show how each person's unique ballot and vote for each round is being tabulated. And so anytime you can do any kind of a visual, um, something like this, it really helps the voters and the general public, and I have to say the media too, because we have to educate the media on what is ranked choice voting and how it is secure and how we are going to tabulate the results. And so I wanted to show you a couple more examples of um, a way you can present this information so that the public can understand how the votes are being reallocated to other candidates as the tabulation occurs on election night. Um, everybody is used to having election results before the 10 o'clock news, right? Well, in, sometimes in ranked choice voting, we, it takes a little bit longer. Um, as the gentleman from um, Alameda indicated that they still are counting uh, mail ballots after the election night. So the same thing is going to happen with ranked choice voting. It will take some time um, to pull all the election results together. Some of the candidates will automatically win on election night if they receive over 51% of the vote. Those that don't will have to go into the rounds of tabulation. This is an example of a um, grid style ballot is there on your left, if you're looking at it on your right is the columns. And there are various ways you can design the ballot. Um, Minneapolis um, allows ranking of up to three voters, three, three candidates, I'm sorry. Um, other jurisdictions um, rank up to six and maybe up to 10 candidates. That's a decision that you'll have to make, but you'll notice the voter instructions at the top it's really important to show a little visual for what they, how to actually um, mark the ballot, and it's that that's a really important piece of it, all of it. I wanted to talk a little bit about educating the public. Again, I'm partial to Minneapolis because that's where I've um, worked in ranked choice voting, um, but they've done a really good job on their website, and I have the address there: voteminneapolismn.gov. And you can go there and um, just get all kinds of background information for how they implemented it starting in 2009. They use social media, I know y'all do here in Denver too, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, to keep the public and the voters and the candidates informed and engaged in the entire process, including on election night when we were doing tabulation. The use of Twitter and Facebook was um, a really good uh, way to keep everybody engaged. Um, they have a video I'm going to show at the end on how tabulation occurs. That's on their website also. Um, they do um, voter outreach handouts in various languages. Um, the one that really helped them the most, I think, is the voter information guide mailing. They mail this to every household in the city of Minneapolis. And in ranked choice voting elections, which is once every four years, they include more information about what ranked choice voting is and how it works. And they do a post-election survey they have in 2013, I believe they did it again this year, um, surveying election workers and voters and various people. And the voter guide was identified as the most effective tool for learning about ranked choice voting. But I have to stop here and again always say that our most important informant of, to the voters is our poll workers in the polling places on election day. 
my colleagues in North Carolina who did a ranked choice voting statewide election in a very short period of time, the poll workers in the polling places are the ones that really, really helped inform the voters and be sure they um, had the right information. Um, how it works, educating the voters. I have this handout available over here. Um, if some of you would like to take that, this is what Minneapolis uses. It tells people how not to do, what not to do with the big red circle and, and the line drawn through it. It also provides information at the bottom about how to count your vote. And it also says that um, if you've made a mistake on your ballot, you can please ask for another ballot and you can start over. So that is like a poster that's in every voting location, which is also really, really good. Um, I wanted to give you just a couple of statistical things because I love statistics. And um, looking back on um, Minneapolis, this is from November of 2013. I don't know they have all of these numbers put together from this past November's election. But I think it's um, important to note that the overvotes in are very, very less than less than 0.5 percent, which um, is probably comparable to any normal election that you have. Um, skipped rankings, um, there was again less than 0.5 percent. They repeated the candidates in a few, and so that was an area they identified by looking at these statistics that they had to do a little better job on voter education. And so that's the benefit of doing some of these post-election statistics and analysis of how the ballots were actually voted. You can see where do you need to uh, continue to engage with the voters to be sure um, that they understand. Um, the next one um, relates to how many people voted, how many choices, how many people were ranked. In the mayor's race in 2013, well over 75% of the voters did three choices. They ranked all three choices. Again, there were a lot of candidates for mayor. You'll notice if you can see this, I'm not sure if everyone can, um, the city council race that only had one candidate, well, of course, only 96% of the people ranked more than, only vote, only ranked one candidate because it was only one. Um, but if you look down any, any race that had um, more than three or four candidates, um, they, they chose at least three choices when they were ranking their ballot. And so these are really good statistics to go back and look at post-election when you can review everything after you've got the election certified. Um, the last thing I want to show is the um, video, and let me see if I can do this. This is on the City of Minneapolis website, and it's a really nice little simple, easy to understand visual about how we're going to count the votes on election night. So I'm gonna see if this works. Oops, it didn't work. So I'm gonna rely on the gentleman to make it go. In most elections, you only vote for one candidate for each office. But in some elections, voters can rank three or more candidates for each office. It's called ranked choice voting. Here's an example of how it works. All of the candidates will be listed on the ballot in three columns. Make your first choice vote in column one by filling in the oval of the candidate you'd most like to win. Vote for your second choice in column two and make your third choice in column three. That's all there is to it. Now let's see how the votes are counted. Let's say there are four candidates running for mayor, Asha, Zach, Omar, and Lucy. Once the polls close, we count all the first choice votes first. To be elected mayor, a candidate needs more than half the votes. In this example, Asha has more than half of the votes, so she's declared the winner. However, if no candidate gets more than half the votes, we start eliminating candidates and counting the next choices of those who voted. In this example, Zach is the candidate with the smallest number of first choice votes, so he is cut. We use the second choice votes on Zach's ballots and count those voters' second choices instead. If one of the remaining candidates now has more than half of the total votes, that candidate is declared the winner. If not, the next lowest candidate, Lucy, is eliminated. Her votes are now counted for the next choice on the ballot. Some of Lucy's votes went to Zach, who was already eliminated, so those new votes for Zach instead count for those voters' third choice candidate.
We are now down to two candidates, and Omar clearly has more than half of the votes. That makes him the winner. That's how Ranked Choice Voting works. For more information on Ranked Choice Voting, visit our website. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Connie. So I think we're actually gonna try to get a hands-on experience next, so maybe Amber will introduce us to that opportunity. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of ways that we can test this out. Um, first, you have some paper ballots that should be on your table. Uh, we also have the tablets that are in the back of the room against the uh, far wall. And once we collect everything, we will count in the, in the tabulation room and bring the results out and show what those look like on the um, screen. Um, I think what I'll do is I'm going to kick off with one question that I have um, just given uh, Denver and the jurisdiction that we have here in the city and county of Denver. Um, and, the, and the question I have is actually for Dave McDonald. Um, he, um, being from Oakland, is a Section 203 county, which means they have multiple <laughs> languages um, that they present their ballots in. And so my question really is, um, given that Denver is also a Section 203 county, uh, we put all of our ballot materials and instructions out in Spanish. Um, I wonder if you could share some information maybe about your experience with uh, multiple languages for voters in, in Oakland. Thanks. Yeah, it's a real challenge. Um, when I was a registrar, we had three languages, English, Spanish, and Chinese. And anything you do in English, you have to do in those other two languages. So if you have an English poll worker, you have to have a Spanish-speaking poll worker. And they have to be bilingual, which is interesting. Uh, I, I got in trouble with DOJ because we had a really hard time finding enough bilingual Chinese poll workers. I could find a, poll workers who spoke only Chinese but limited English even though we had other English-speaking poll workers there, that was not good enough for DOJ, and so they dinged us pretty hard on even though we had the poll worker there, was not bilingual. So it is a challenge finding staff as well uh, that speak those languages. And I think now, I think LA is up to nine languages, Los Angeles is up to nine different languages. So when you look at your ballot, it gets even more complicated because you can have uh, all the languages on one ballot, or you can have separate ballots for each language, which means in, in California, our ballots are huge. Uh, it's not unusual for us to have five ballot cards. Um, so imagine all the boxes you have, English boxes, Spanish boxes, Chinese, and then so on, whatever the other languages are. And so it is, it is a, it's tough to do, it is real hard. So. Uh, my hat's off to anybody that does multiple languages. Three is, is two isn't too bad, it's English and Spanish, because you can have a bilingual ballot with both languages on a single piece of paper. But get past two, it gets even more complicated. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. One thing I'll add just about, about these Bay Area elections in a particular, uh, but also just about sort of this general question of, um, of racial and ethnic minorities and a ranked choice ballot. In, in the Bay Area, as Dave was saying, there's big ballots because they're voting on a lot of things. I think San Francisco in 2016 had more than 30 city ballot measures, if I'm remembering right, and more than 10 state ballot measures and voting for president and many other offices, and then down to the Board of Supervisors using ranked choice voting. So when you're sort of seeing ranked choice voting results, it's in a climate where people are voting on a lot of things, you know, a whole lot of people voting by mail, a whole lot of people voting in person, a whole lot of people, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, most there for you know, voting for president or something. And you are seeing you know, really pretty effective use of the ranked choice ballot across demographics. Now, you'll, you'll still see kind of a mirror of the, the differences of how lower-income voters sort of handle ballots uh, than higher-income voters. But um, one thing we've looked at very closely is when you're, particularly when you're replacing two rounds of election, almost always one of them has lower turnout than, than the other. And when it has lower turnout, it's sort of disproportionately lower among those communities. So any differences that you see and how people of color may be handling, say, a ranked choice ballot um, is, is, much, is 
bigger or magnified when it's actually the differences of, of, a, of, a, of, of, of turnout that, that, that you see. The last thing I'll mention on that is New York City uh, used to have 32 local school board elections um, using ranked choice voting. Um, did it from like the by 1970 to the to to about 2000, and there were nine of them, and uh, or no, 32 of them with nine seats on each one. So a lot of offices, um, at, but they were voting by counting by hand, and people were like, oh, that's kind of a pain. Why don't we move them to voting on equipment and and not use the ranked choice system? And the Department of Justice at that point had to pre-clear changes to the New York City ballots under under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And that was actually the last time the DOJ denied preclearance to a change because they thought it would be an adverse impact on racial minorities to take away the ranked choice ballot because of the effective use that they were making of the ranked choice ballot. So, so I think we're just going to, people should line up because I, I think we want to have questions from the microphone. So why don't, why don't we do that? Hello. Hi, thanks. First of all, I want to say thank you. It was an awesome presentation. But this is a policy question for those that really implemented it. In terms of how did you decide on how many choices you were going to give the electorate for each candidate or each race? So I'll just, Minneapolis, ours was actually dictated by what our elections equipment could handle. So that's why we had only three choices. Our sister city of St. Paul has up to six choices because they handled it in a different way and so they had different policy choices. And the same thing in Alameda County. We had three choices really just because our voting system could only handle three. And what we're seeing in the new generation equipment, including I think the Dominion system that people just were trying out, that that I believe can do up to 10 rankings. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna generally see, I think in with, with that kind of ballot design, an increased number of rankings. I think it's certainly uh, sensible to, uh, you know, when it's five or six, seven candidates to kind of allow people to rank that many. Uh, just as one thing and just about what voters wanna do is that in the New York, uh, rather, sorry, in the, <laughs> in the uh, 2016 presidential cycle, we did a, uh, a poll with College of William and Mary when at the time of the Iowa caucuses and the Republican contest, there were 11 candidates and we invited people to rank the candidates. We didn't say please rank them all, we said we invited them uh, to rank the candidates. These were a thousand likely Republican voters from around the country and more than nine out of 10 chose to rank everybody. And you really saw a lot of coherence and, and meaning in their rankings including Donald Trump was the plurality first choice leader and the plurality last choice candidate. It's kind of an interesting example of, of how voters were reacting to his candidacy. Yeah, I was just gonna say in San Francisco, I think uh, the initiative was a full ranking, but there, within the initiative it was written to have the option for, for only three if that's what the voting equipment uh, would only allow. So San Francisco has this elastic uh, thing built into the initiative that they can go to full ranking. Uh, hi, my name is Rafi. Um, my question is more so directed to Dave, but please, if anyone has insights, chime in. Um, you had mentioned uh, voter education being a priority when Alameda adopted ranked choice. What was your process in actually gathering your advisors from the community. Who did you decide to select? Who did you include in the process? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty open. Uh, the League of Women Voters was a very active participant. And um, so they had several representatives. And also in each of the cities, there's a, uh, you know, Alameda County is a pretty liberal uh, area. We have a lot of activists, you know, it's, we're home to Berkeley. Anybody heard of Berkeley here? So a pretty liberal city. And so there was a, a very large uh, community of activists. And so I invited some of them to be on the committee. And it was pretty open. I mean, kind of whoever wanted to be on it, uh, would, as long as they weren't too disruptive. I only had to call the sheriff a couple of times. But, um, you know, so we had a lot of people on the advisory committee because I figured the more input, the better. And, I, and you know what happens when you have a committee like that. People are all excited at first and then kind of the fringe drop out and the ones who were really interested hang in there through the whole time. Do you want to comment uh, on Minneapolis? Yeah, you know, um, I feel like our voter education 
work has um, changed each, each election, and it's not just about ranked choice voting. We also had some other reforms from the state of Minnesota that I would say sort of layer on to what's happening with ranked choice voting, including we adopted early voting for the state, and that is, again, then just a different layer of, of, of kind of how the engagement works. Um, in the, I think in the original year when the, when the materials were developed, um, we had a similar process to what you did where um, there was sort of an open invite to engaged um, uh, constituencies, um, uh, organizations that worked in the community um, trying to get really community-based feedback and we use that to develop some of the materials, but not just the materials, it was more about then what do we do to resource kind of getting out into the community. And I would say that's sort of like the biggest thing that has continued every election is I swear there's elections workers, but also other kind of nonpartisan groups that just cover the city, it feels like, um, for a pretty long time during the elections. Uh, season. So there is just a lot of voter engagement happening, a lot of, again, a lot of nonpartisan uh, voter participation kind of work happening around ranked choice voting. I'll add one thing, and maybe Gerard, you can uh, amplify on this, but my, my recollection about San Francisco is that, you know, it, 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 it did a lot of the upfront work, which is you often see like in the first election, and then they do less go going forward but they did use some of the cost savings that they were getting from going to ranked choice voting to ultimately have more lasting staffers involved in voter education for everything, um, if, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but, that, but, but then that sort of, there was sort of a new, you know, so the city's saving money, but it's, it's using a little bit of that to now have staffers who do voter education throughout the time. Is that, well, is that well, correct? Currently it's, it's the, currently, it's the staffers who do the uh, outreach and community uh, but when ranked choice voting was implemented, uh, a lot of the outreach was contracted out. We had groups like the Gray Panthers, Senior Citizen Group. They were funded by the Department of Elections to have people from their organization go out and make presentations. So we actually had some community funding, I think, the first, first two cycles, just to do a very blanket uh, outreach. Hi, my name is Celeste Landry, and I was happy today to see that there was a two-winner race on today's election, because there is a council member race like that in the Denver ballot. Um, and I, w I wanted to let people know that I have copies of the Cambridge ballots for this year, where they have 26 rankings for city council and 12 for the school committee. Um, and this afternoon, Rob Ritchie and I are going to be giving a talk on multi-winner ranked elections at 1.30 at the Denver Press Club, if anybody wants to attend that. Um, and I wanted to ask Elizabeth, because Minneapolis also has a multi-winner race. So could you talk a little bit about how that works? Some people won't be able to make it this afternoon, so you, you'll be all they probably here. Thanks. Sure, it, um, this is sort of one of these things, honestly, like the explaining feels a little more complicated than what it is. But we have a, um, a park board at large positions, uh, three, and they are um, elected differently. So um, on your ballot, uh, as you fill out the ballot, you select three. And um, then that will ultimately be selected as your three um, park board candidates. So it's different than for each park board candidate that you would have three choices, who's gonna fill spot one versus spot two versus spot three. So it's just a, a different way, a different mechanism. And this was, again, because of how those seats were set up in our city charter uh, originally, um, kind of dictated how that, how that happened. It's sort of one of these races, honestly, where I, I feel like um, uh, you can get into the weeds <laughs> with how the counting works. In the end, how you fill out the ballot, and which is, I mean, in the end, the critical piece are people understanding the system. Are they filling their ballot out correctly? Um, to me, that as a, someone who's been a candidate I've, and kind of seen how those elections work, I, I feel like that's the critical piece. There is some ballot design issue to this as well. Sometimes um, there's some challenges presented by your elections vendor. Or your, uh, so, so that's another issue. 
Yeah, and I'll just add that for a multi-winner election system, sort of different algorithms or choices one can make. There's sort of ways you can do it where it preserves a majority principle. So, you know, ranked choice voting is designed when you're electing one person to uphold the principle of majority rule. Um, and you can do that so each person has to, has to do that when, when a multi-winner. More common is what they, what they do for the park board elections, what they do in Cambridge, which is, a, which is to try to have as many people as possible help elect someone. And so when you have more seats, you can actually expand the numbers that are likely to do that. So in Cambridge, you generally have uh, at least 90% of people um, voting for a winner, but they do that by having each winner not needing 90% to win or 50% to win, but actually needing about a ninth of the vote to win. And, and, and that's how that works. But that's, 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 a, that's sort of a, a policy choice for, for multi-winner races. Hi, thank you for doing this. Uh, Councilman Paul Lopez, I represent uh, the West Side in, here in Denver. Um, two questions, so, and, and they kind of have to do with each other, and I think I alluded to them earlier in our, in our private conversation, but one, I'm, I'm curious about the interface between this kind of ballot uh, and an all-male uh, ballot election, and the, the, the conflict I would see um, that would present itself and wondering how you would recon reconcile that or if there's a protocol to do so. If somebody accidentally filled um, first choice and fifth choice or for the same person by error, in person you'd be able to come up and say, hey, I messed up, can I get another ballot printed? How do you reconcile that, that issue um, when it comes to an all-male ballot and just that, those dynamics and just want to know what your thoughts are um, with that dynamic? Well, I, I can address that. Uh, in Alameda County, over half of our voters vote by mail and half go to the polling place. So we kind of have that now. So if you're at a polling place and you make a mistake on your ballot, you know, you vote for the same candidate twice uh, and you feed it into the machine, it'll kick it out right then and the poll worker will give you a fresh ballot and you can correct your mistake if, if you want to. Now, if you're voting by mail, you don't have that opportunity to correct the mistake. Uh, so what we do uh, is we scan all those vote by mail ballots through a high speed scanner. Any uh, ballots that are marked incorrectly will get kicked out and then we'll have staff go through and look at those and see if we can determine why. So for instance, sometimes what'll happen, I'll vote for Rob as my choice and then I'll think about it and I'll scratch it out and vote for somebody else. Well, the machine just sees two votes. But if you look at it, you can tell what the voter intent was. So if we know what the voter intent is, then we'll copy it to a fresh ballot. Does that, I, I hope that answers the question. So we, we do our best shot, but we can't catch them all. Yeah, that, so, I mean, knowing what Denver Elections does, I mean, it's the same kind of thought process. Um, but I'm just, I'm just wondering if there's any policy and protocol on that. So I, just Some because we had this cities. short conversation Sorry. before, I'll say what happened in Minneapolis, and maybe this is kind of how you've ultimately dealt with it, is we adopted an ordinance to ensure that kind of those policy protocols, which are very kind of a elections administrator kind of driven on what are those uh, protocols, um, and were clear, transparent, and people understood how the ballot would be interpreted, again, with the... Um, intention you're going to give the most benefit of the doubt to the voter so that their votes count. What was the name of that ordinance? Just <laughs> I, we can find it and okay. we can put it up on the, um, I don't know where you're posting information. Yeah, but I'll just go ahead and answer this because this is already addressed actually in most of our laws in Colorado. Um, but, but we do, with our Dominion system, which is different than what um, I think any of the systems that are up here, we have what we call adjudication. And so even now with our mail ballot process, if a voter makes a mistake, it goes on screen and then we have a whole review process, a bipartisan review process right. where they resolve these discrepancies. And so in a ranked choice model, we have a voter intent guide it's called. And so you would still be able to resolve those discrepancies and, and resolve them so that the ballot was counted appropriately. Um, we also instruct, the good thing about mail ballots, and this is kind of one of the things that, and I know there was a reference to how great 
that kind of model is, but with ballot delivery, it gives us an ability to, to send instructions so every voter in the city gets the exact same instruction and we're no longer relying on instructions happening verbally at polling places or things like that. So we've really increased the consistency for how we deliver instructions for voting and we have an ability to design those instructions as we need to within the packet that every voter gets. Um, and so one of the things that's kind of happening in addition to this event is next week the Center for Civic Design is going to test out three different um, basically ways of designing ballots and three different types of instructions and ask voters for their feedback um, and then they'll be able to share all that data with us, which I think is really important because the Center for Civic Design, not only in ranked choice voting, but they've been doing this work kind of with other types of voting. And their research is really guiding the way that we now are designing instructions. And certainly the way we've done it in Denver and um, Stu Club, who's our, our staffer that does a lot of this, he's really tried to adopt the principles of best design so that, so that people are getting more visual materials and better instructions. And, and you can even see that on some of the ballots that we did. I think Jimmy used the Center for Civic Design principles, um, which is really helpful for voters. So there's a lot of things in there. and. Um, and certainly with our voter intent structure in Colorado's law for, um, for elections, we have those things where we always want to make sure that the, the voter's intent is captured, regardless. And, I, and I'm, so. I'm keenly aware that I think Alton did a good job in one of our tours last time of kind of showing that behind the scenes process. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if that prevalence of those errors uh, increased compared to the your typical ballot uh, before or if they kind of stayed the same and I think you talked a little bit about it and just kind of our effect how that would work in our system so I appreciate that Amber. Yep. Thank you. Well I know the chart I showed you um, kind of showed the percentages for the various mistakes that voters might make and um, I do have a chart up here that um, City of Minneapolis did incorporate into their <coughs> charter which is basically their voter intent guide and it's a nice visual that shows if there is a mistake um, in the first ranking, that the second ranking then becomes the first choice vote. And it shows how the voter's ballot will be um, counted to the most, to the most that voter intent can possibly be, be made. And I think the, the issues of, are, are very similar for RCV and non-RCV races, right? You can make a mistake on a non-RCV race and still have to figure out how to get your ballot. Um, but the one thing that um, I, I believe, and I'm going to confirm this, and I don't know if Dave has the numbers, but, but in, I, I'm pretty sure that the rates of at least invalidated ballots are not any more with vote by mail than the in-person, which is quite interesting when you think about it. But they also have more time, right? So there's, that's, and that's again, just vote by mail versus in-person voting for everybody. But um, they have a little more time, a little more time to think about the candidates. And you know, one of the things that's interesting about ranked choice voting is it creates these new incentives to find out more about candidates and candidates to tell you more about themselves. And so there's a, voters tend to learn a little bit more about their voting, whether they're voting in person or vote, voting by mail. Any more questions? And then people should come to the microphone if they have one. Hi, Elizabeth Littlepage, election judge coordinator for Denver. How did ranked choice voting change your wait times for voters in lines? Well, that's a good question. You know, it's, uh, we have such a complicated ballot in California, so many ballot cards um, that we have to make sure we have enough voting booths in a, in a polling place. So I didn't see waiting times because of ranked choice voting delayed very much. <clears throat> During a, a very uh, exciting contest, such as uh, uh, the presidential election, yes, there are lines out the door. Um, we, we do a lot of early voting. Uh, so the, uh, usually 29 days before the election, you can still come and vote. And uh, we would have lines out the door around the block because people were so excited about voting for the president. And this during the first Obama election. I know I had one woman came in. She was first time she'd ever voted. She was 105 years old. And there was a huge line of people. And so this is the one time I made the exception. I let her take cuts. And she came to the front of the line and, and she voted. But really, to answer your question, the RCV 
does not really confuse people that much because it's fairly simple and there aren't that many contests really with RCV. It's just your, your local, local races. I'll just add that in, in Minneapolis, I think similar to what you described, we have election uh, judges who are there just to make sure there is someone to explain the ballot if there are last minute questions. Again, that's in addition to kind of all the other things that have happened. And then just, again, we still in Minneapolis, we have our municipal elections on a year where there are no other elections. And so the 45% was humongous turnout for us. So we do staff to make sure people don't have inappropriate weights, but this is a different turnout kind of election than other elections, um, presidential year elections. Other questions? My name is Ryan and I'm visiting here from Utah, so huh. I really appreciate you uh, holding this event for us. Um, my question revolves, one of the virtues that we hear about ranked choice voting an awful lot is that it eliminates plurality in elections. And there are several instances in ranked choice voting where plurality still is an issue. One specific one maybe uh, Gerard can answer. Um, in 2006 in San Francisco, there were almost 20,000 votes cast in a District 4 race, and the winner won that election with about 8,400 votes cast. So by the time you exhaust some of those votes and things like that, there is still the possibility to end up with kind of a false, false uh, majority on that of getting the 50%. I just wonder if you could talk about that just a little bit. Well, I'll start and then others can comment too. So, so in ranked choice voting, if you, like in Australia, you may, people may know that Australia mandates voting. And uh, so you, not everyone votes, but they can be fine for not voting. Um, they also, in that spirit, they mandate ranking. Right, so they're really like trying to make you make a choice, right? And um, and that's not something that's part of any ranked choice voting election uh, use in the United States or anywhere else that I know of. And so, if you don't mandate ranking, then it's possible that you know that your top choices that you've ranked get eliminated, and then your ballot's not going to count for someone, right? So that if you compare the first round totals with the last round totals, there's a certain number of drop off, like people that have chosen not to not to rank. In the uh, places where they restrict rankings to three, that can be some people who rank three people who just don't get to the final two. If it's uh, where they don't have restriction on rankings, it's, it's sort of a voluntary abstention. It's a choice to say, you know what? I don't care about any of these other people. You know, I'm, I'm indifferent to them. And I guess my belief has always been, well, if I'm indifferent to the other people, it's sort of like not voting in the first place. You know, it's an abstention. Um, so that kind of... Uh, drop off, which tends, by the way, to be a lot less than in regular runoff elections. Like the drop off in regular runoff elections, as I showed in that slide, on average is almost 40%, right, in, in these congressional runoff um, primaries, which I know that Utah, say, is debating. They might end up having, you know, congressional primary runoffs would probably drop off to 30, 40%. What you see, kind of the, the drop off you might see in a ranked choice voting election is more in the order of, of 5 to 10%. You know, so it's people that, 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 that drop off. In, in a really fractured race, like the, this one in San Francisco you might be referring to, no candidate got more than 11% of first choices. Super, you know, it would have been a fractured race under any circumstance. And, and so um, a limit of three rankings, there were a lot of ballots that didn't, didn't end up counting when it got down to two. But that's a real outlier. The, the rest are usually in the sort of five to 10% drop off. Um, so, it's not necessarily a majority of the first round, but it is a majority of the willing, in a sense, particularly if there's not a limit on rankings of people that made a choice, they're having a chance to express it. And, and, and uh, so it's a majority of the final round. It might not, might not always be a majority of the first round. I don't know if anyone else wants to add on to that. I think that's a, that's a good explanation. I will say, too, where I, and, and maybe, Rob, you can speak to this. Um, the majority, vast majority of races seem to uh, have something that is 50% plus one. There are some, including Minneapolis, where we've had something, uh, again, because of the drop-off, where it is less than 50%, but still, the races I have seen have been in the high 40s. So maybe you can speak a little bit to, when we talk about plurality winner, you know, what, what does that look like in ranked choice voting? Yeah, and it's almost like there's sort of a different, different measure also of sort of what voters might be meaning. Like in the, um, current Minneapolis mayor, the race that just happened, uh, the winner was ranked in the top three out of a, was 10 candidates for mayor? 11? More? 
something like that. Something like a bunch of candidates. Um, and this person, I think maybe even 15 or something, right? So ranked in the top three by more than half of voters. However, um, some of those voters ranked his opponent in the final round as a higher choice. So his, the ballots didn't count for him in the final choice because they were counting for someone else. But those voters had made a sort of a expression of interest and support for, for, for that candidate. And so if you look at it that way, you almost always get the winners getting expressions of support for more than 50%. And from, in a sense, from, a, from a, uh, the, the, the voter perspective, they, they in a sense feel feel represented by that person to a degree, right? You know, like, like they, they made an affirmative decision to rank them. Um, but anyway, that's a, sort of getting in the weeds. But it is sort of a way that it's a different, it's not just sort of a one-on-one -on -one thing, it's, a, it's how you attract support from a, from a community of people. And certainly the candidates see it that way where they need to reach out to as many people as possible. So when the, the new mayor of Minneapolis, you know, got an ex affirmative expression of support for more than half the voters, and that to me seems important. I just want to say something on that because, and this, is, and this isn't expressly answering that question, but just on this point of how candidates look at being ranked, uh, I talked to the, the winning candidate in a race that wasn't featured in my presentation, but also was very competitive. Uh, there was a, a socialist uh, candidate. Um, there was a Green Party candidate, there was a, a kind of a business-minded DFL candidate and another DFL candidate. And so the, the, the winner was the DFL candidate um, uh, who, who called himself a kind of a progressive DFL candidate. And he said to me after the race that he looked at the fact that he was ranked by 70-some percent of voters in, in, in the election. I mean, he was looking at who actually wanted to select him as one of their top three, and that mattered to him because it helped him understand also the spread of where were the voters. It gave him a very clear picture of where were the voters at in the ward that he was elected to represent, what was the contour of that, and then where did he fall within that. So I thought it was really interesting, a comment to me by a winning candidate. Other questions? Um, can you, uh, anybody say at all, talk at all about uh, what the opposition has been as cities and, and entities have taken on ranked choice voting? What are the common threads in that opposition and what are some of the strongest points that opposition groups have, have made? Who wants to tackle that? Well, I, I can talk a little bit about it. <clears throat> you know, the, I guess the opposition is uh, a lack of understanding of what ranked choice voting is. It's something different, it's new, and it can be confusing once you start diving down into some of the minutia. Uh, so we got that a lot. <clears throat> we got opposition because of cost, even though I think if it's done correctly, there's cost savings, but initially you spend more money uh, if you're gonna do a lot of outreach. Uh, we had to buy, we had to do all of our outreach, we had to buy software to do our CV. We had the additional poll workers. So there was some initial expense that normally wouldn't be in an election, but then, you know, the software gets amortized over multiple elections and, and that kind of goes away. So the other thing I think that, uh, that I kind of saw is elected officials, and I know we have some in the room, so don't take this personally, but elected officials know how to win a certain kind of contest. And now all of a sudden, here's a ranked choice voting contest, and this is different. I've never won that kind of election, so what do I do? And so I think there's been a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, there were some unrealistic expectations on candidates' parts. Uh, I know we had one uh, mayor in one of the cities who was an uh, ardent, ardent supporter of ranked choice voting because it was, he thought it was going to save him money in running his campaign. He'd only have to run one campaign rather than two. So he pushed it through the city and got it adopted. Well, and of course you know what happened. He, he lost the ranked choice voting contest and now he is an ardent uh, advocate to eliminate ranked choice voting. And he used to send me emails all the time saying, why did I make them do this? So it was, it was kind of funny to see that happen. But, so I think it's a it's really a lack of understanding sometimes about what it really means to win an election out of campaign. 
So yeah, and, and I think, uh, sorry, so I'll just sort of add very quickly that and then I'll turn over to Elizabeth, which, but I think is uh, that one of the lessons learned in, in Minneapolis in some ways has been a, a, a good um, example for, for doing this, which is to make sure that all the players in elections, the people most involved, really understand the system, because if they go in misinformed and then lose, like Dave was mentioning earlier, some people go out there and say, rank me first, second, and third, thinking that helps, and it doesn't help, and, and, and if they find out later it didn't help, and they, you know, it just, just makes them feel stupid, or something, you know, and then they're, they're more, more likely to feel like they, they shouldn't do it. So just making sure like, the, the, the key players understand it, and then understand outcomes, which is one of the things that's in, interesting about that Minneapolis video, which is showing both winners and losers sort of accepting the uh, outcome. We also had to deal with the situation in these early uh, adoptions of ranked choice voting that there wasn't a turnkey solution to implementing it. There would be uh, you know, sort of workarounds and, 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 and things that, that, that looked messier than we would have wished, and I think that kind of can expose the system to uh, discontent. But one thing that's encouraging is that um, you know, there's, there's 11 cities in rising using ranked choice voting. They've all had it now for a while. Um, all of those ones that, that I mentioned. And, um, and there was this survey done in 2013, 2014, every, that, uh, by, by the Rutgers poll, and they polled you know, 2,400 people collectively in, in these seven cities and found majority support for each one of them kind of in, in uh, the voters. Doesn't mean that everyone likes it in those cities and it's still something to, to, uh, to try to address concerns about the change, but um, it is showing that voters are, are growing to accept it. The only thing I would, so those are kind of the, the two things I, um, I would just add to the points um, made about elected officials. I, I would broaden that to people who believe they benefit from existing processes and it's hard for them to wrap their ways, their, their minds around, you know, what would a change be like. Um, so uh, you invest a lot in how you figure out how to, um, benefit from an existing process. And so that could be candidates, it could be people who spend a lot of time helping elect candidates, it can be endorsing organizations, or, or others who are just involved in that process. Um, so we certainly have seen that in Minneapolis and in St. Paul and in Minnesota, and those kind of entrenched interests are <coughs> everywhere. But um, I think one thing that was, again, very interesting to me about this particular election in Minneapolis, and I think it's part of the, just the evolution of who are candidates and who's participating in the process is that people who lost their election <laughs> um, uh, in, this, in this election were still fans, vocal fans of ranked choice voting. So um, it, it wasn't, you know, everybody who lost said, I hate the system, and everybody who won says a great system. I feel like we're starting to get over that hump and people thinking more about kind of what's the general outcome. Yeah, and I, I just want to say in San Francisco, one form of opposition I've seen are the people who come forward and say, other people don't understand this. The person saying it says, oh yeah, I get it, but other people. Now if somebody comes up and says, I don't understand it, we could show them a video, give them educational materials or whatever, and inform them. But there are, I, I guess there are people making judgments on other people's <clears throat> competency to understand this. So I think it might make sense just to come to a close, but we'll, we'll wait around here a little bit. Um, there's, there's these materials that have been mentioned that are, that, 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 are, that are around, and we'll stay as resources at least for oh, 15, 20 minutes and, and turn it back to Amber. Sure. Okay, so we have results um, from the election that you just did. We're going to show sort of how this worked with one race. Um, and as we bring that, okay, so we'll sort of scroll this in a little bit. Um, so this is on the uh, quarterback question, um, which is an important one for the city and county of Denver um, and all Broncos fans in Colorado. Um, so this is sort of the quarterback question and this, this demonstrates how the ranked choice process worked and it did actually go through three rounds. So this was a good example of, of the process happening. Um, in the first round, and if you can't see it, you can come up here and we are gonna post all this, but the first round, um, Eli Manning was winning, but with 42%, right? 
So the second round, uh, the bottom, so Colin Kaepernick was at the bottom with eight votes. Those got moved, and then the, the folks that chose a second choice for those ballots went to the first. So then Eli went to 49%. So he still wasn't at the 50% threshold. So then the third round occurred. And in the third round, when both Trevor Simeon and Colin Kaepernick were dropped, and then their votes reallocated, Eli Manning wins with 56% of the vote. So you can kind of see the progression in the rounds and how this would look um, should, it, should it happen again. Um, so um, I don't know if, Rob, you want to share anything else about that? So I, I'm just going to comment on one aspect of it, which is that San Francisco has decided to report all results going down to two to provide a consistent, like, here's the sort of mandate. So you notice that Manning shockingly, from my perspective, is, is, <laughs> is uh, that far ahead. But if you kept going down to two, it would actually probably rise up to 65% or something like that. So a, a bit of a clear thing. So that's one of the practices that we're starting to see jurisdictions do. So yeah, so um, I, think, I think this is a good, good illustration. It gave you an idea of sort of a little vote today and a test that we did um, here. Um, this is, again, uh, the, the system that we have is Dominion. Um, if you do have any questions in particular about that system, Stephen Bennett is here. He's in the back. He looks like a sales, no, I'm just kidding. You don't look like he's, he's, our, he's Dominion's sales rep in the back. So if you do have particular questions about how the system works, he's here and available to do that. Um, I know the panelists are going to hang around and can certainly answer more questions. Um, just a couple reminders, make sure you signed in. We are going to send an email out um, and let you all know where the resources and the video from today's event is posted. Um, we have materials over on this uh, wall here, so if you do want to take handouts or any extra materials with you, feel free to do that. Um, and again, we will have all of this posted in a place where you can access all the great information that we received today. Um, so with that, um, on behalf of Clerk Johnson, oh, There was one race that had two winners. Oh, you know, we actually, we only brought out this one, um, so I apologize for that. We can post that in the materials if that works. We just, we wanted to show one example, so I just had them bring out the one, uh, the one report. So we'll, we'll put it in the materials for so, sure. Uh, so it looks like 100% validity that two people skipped. There's two people abstained. Yep, right? there were two people that skipped yeah. that race. So we had two blanks on there too. Um, so, so with that, the panelists will be around. Um, if you do have questions for them, feel free to reach out. Um, and thank you all for coming today. Thanks for being here on behalf of Clerk Johnson, who opened the session, and, and our office and, and the City and County of Denver. Thanks for attending. Um, it was a great session today, and thank you to all the panelists for, for traveling to be with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you.